Okay, today we talked about equations that look quadratic but aren't. And we went a little further with one of the examples. But here we have an equation. Now this equation is going to turn out to be quadratic, but it's not obvious unless you've seen equations of this nature and are kind of used to how you look at them. Uh, not at all obvious, uh, just looking at it the first time, that this is going to be quadratic. Now there's a general principle. If an equation has denominators, you multiply both sides by a common denominator. Preferably the least common denominator because it makes the equation simpler. And sometimes the only common denominator you have, well, the, the common denominator you have when you multiply the two denominators, which is how you can get a common denominator. Uh, when you multiply the two denominators, it's very possible that you get the least common denominator. But if the two denominators share factors, then you can usually, you, you can reduce the least, the, the common denominator to the least common denominator. Not going to worry about that here. In this example, uh, we have denominators 3 and x. So 3 times x is a common denominator. Turns out it's also the least common denominator because 3 and x don't have common factors. So anyhow, common denominator is 3x. We're going to multiply both sides of the equation by 3x. I do this in more detail than you're going to want to do routinely, but I'll probably ask you to do this detail at least a few times. Um, so we multiply 3x by the left-hand side. We multiply 3x by the right-hand side. Very straightforward. And we then use the distributive law. Now I'm going to, since we've got fractions, I'm going to write 3x as 3x over 1. And that's then multiplied by the x over 3 to get this term. And 3x over 1 times the 2 over x to get this. And of course 3x times 4 comes out 12x. We'll go ahead and multiply that. Now you're going to want to start crossing things out. That's cancellation. Uh, I don't like cancellation in this course uh, and pre-calculus level courses because 95% uh, of the people who come into a pre-calculus course don't understand cancellation well enough to use it. And if I don't make them do this, they never do. Okay, so I'm not going to cancel. I'm going to use simple rules. And I'm going to say, okay, well, 3x times x is 3x squared. 1 times 3 is 3. And over here, 3x times 2 is 6x. 1 times x is x. And that's all straightforward. Now you're going to want to cancel the 3 with the 3. I'm not going to let you do that. We're going to write this as 3 over 3 times x squared over 1. And then we want to make sure it's right. Let's see. If we do 3 times x squared, we get 3x squared. If we do 3 times 1, we get 3. So, yes, this is equal to this. Similarly, 6x over x, 6 over 1 times x over x. That works because 1 times x gives us x. 6 times x gives us 6x. Now, having chosen to rearrange it so that the 3 is divided by the 3, I get 1. And 1 times x squared over 1 is just x squared. Okay. And having chosen to rearrange this, so the x is over the x, I get 6 over 1 times 1, which is 6. And now the equation is x squared plus 6 equals 12x. Now, even this isn't necessarily something you'll immediately recognize as a quadratic equation, unless you think of the general definition of a quadratic equation. It's any equation in which the terms on both sides are multiples of x squared, multiples of x, and plain old numbers. If you have that, then you could, in this case, subtract the 12x from both sides, and now you have a quadratic equation in its general form, um, which is easily solved using the quadratic formula. Okay, well, that's it. But, you know, we assume we've already mastered the quadratic formula, and I think that's pretty much true. Okay, well, we look at another equation. x minus 3 over x plus 5 equals 2x plus 6. We multiply both sides of this equation by the denominator. Now, I said common denominator. Well, 
there's one denominator, there's no other denominator, so that's the denominator. So I could have expanded my general principle by saying, or if there's just one denominator, you multiply both sides by that denominator. Just as in this case, that's going to clear out all your denominators and make the equation much simpler to look at and work with. Okay, so we multiply both sides by x plus 5, and I'm, I'll just write that on this side as x plus 5 over 1, and just an x plus 5 over here means the same thing. Okay. So, when I multiply this by this, I'm going to shortcut some of the details I did over here, but I can see that this is going to be the same as x plus 5 over x plus 5 times x minus 3 over 1. It's the same because the numerator here is x plus 5 times x minus 3. In this form, the numerator is going to be x plus 5 times x minus 3. Uh, and then you have the 1 times x plus 5, or the x plus 5 times 1. So the denominators are equal, so that this is the same as this. And of course, x plus 5 over x plus 5 is 1, so you just end up with the x minus 3. Uh, I didn't write this term, uh, uh, this product down here. Uh, I just used a couple of dots, but now I've written it out. So now we have x minus 3 equals x plus 5 times 2x plus 6. Now, if you think ahead a little bit, if you multiply this term by this term, you're going to get x squared terms and x terms and constant numbers, just like you have over here, and it's going to turn out to be a quadratic equation. So we go through the rest of the details. Okay, so x minus 3 over x plus 5 equals 2x plus 6 comes down to x minus 3 equals x plus 5 times 2x plus 6. We expand this product. I don't like FOIL. I hate to use F-word language like that in a, a, a public class, but uh, it's so ubiquitous. Uh, I, I think, except for when you're learning to factor trinomials, I think it's very limiting. It, 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 it doesn't work. If you have three terms here and three terms here, you can't do that thing to it, okay? Uh, so we use the distributive law in this class. So uh, the distributive law says that x plus 5 times 2x plus 6 is x times 2x plus 6 here plus 5 times 2x plus 6. And everybody's familiar with the distributive law, so I don't think there's any surprise in this. Uh, then uh, the equation becomes this. Well, then multiplying the x through the 2x plus 6, we get 2x squared plus 6x. 5 times the quantity 2x plus 6, again by the distributive law, is 10x plus 30. We collect our terms. 6x and the 10x becomes 16x. And now we have x minus 3 equals 2x squared plus 16x plus 30. Now we're used to having all our terms on the left-hand side. When we use a quadratic formula, it would be okay to put them all on the right-hand side. It would still be the same equation, since you can always turn it around. But I'm going to go ahead and subtract everything here from this side. And here we got it, x minus 3 minus this quantity, which is this whole side. Distributing the negative, we get this. And collecting our terms, we have this, which is in the general form of a quadratic equation. Now, I don't like all the negatives because when we solve this, it's very likely that we're going to need to use the quadratic formula. So, I multiply everything by negative 1 to get this form. And that, I just change all the signs. That's a legal operation since it's equivalent to multiplying by negative 1. Now, a couple things we can, of course, we can use the quadratic formula now, uh, but maybe all we want to know is, is there a solution to this equation, a real number solution? There's always a solution, but sometimes it's complex. Okay? Well, we examine the discriminant to see if there's a real solution. The discriminant's what goes under the square root, and of course, if what's under the square root is negative, then we're not going to have a real number solution. Well, the discriminant is 
you know, you know how to write out the discriminant. Here it is. There's a discriminant for the equation. And that's 225 minus 264. And if I do my arithmetic correctly, that's negative 39. And I do check my arithmetic. I always do it in my head. I don't work these things out in advance. And you know, my head can be unreliable sometimes. Uh, so the solution then is going to include a square root of negative 39, which is the square root of 39 times the square root of negative 1, which is, well, the square root of negative 1 is i, your imaginary number. It's i times the square root of 39. So the solution is a complex number. You have no real solution. Well, we just completed a section on graphing uh, on quadratic functions and had some stuff on the graph. So let's see what we can now do to graph this expression. Okay, uh, if we have the function y equals 2x squared plus 15x plus 33, the first thing we see, and the first thing I drew up here, uh, is just, okay, we've got this. This thing opens upwards. You have a positive multiple of x squared, which means when x gets really big, uh, this is going to get really big, and it's going to be positive, so it's going to be going up. It's above the x-axis because it doesn't have any zeros. This can't equal zero. If a graph goes through the x-axis, the graph of a function, then that function has value zero. If this is the function we're graphing, then if it doesn't have a solution, to, if there's no solution to this equation, the graph can't go through the x-axis. Okay, so here we have the parabola. Um, the next thing I did was I said, okay, well, the quadratic formula gives us zeros at these points, and here's what we get from the quadratic formula. It's very straightforward. There's our square root of 39 times i. In this form, we can take this much of it, the negative 15 fourths, and that's our axis of symmetry. So now we know that the axis of symmetry is x equals negative 15 fourths. You notice when I first did this, I didn't put a y-axis in there. Okay? I didn't know if this was to the left or right of the y-axis. Now, I know how the, everything works, so I could have figured that out very quickly. It would be negative 15 fourths. But Having used a quadratic equation, we kind of see why it is. Then, we want to maybe, before we can determine where the y-axis is, uh, we want to determine two things. Uh, we want to determine what the y-intercept is. Well, that's easy. If this is our equation, if x is 0, y is 33. There's our y-intercept. We also want to calculate the, coordinate, the coordinates of the vertex. Then we can put a scale on this thing. So the coordinates of the vertex are negative 15 fourths, 8, approximately. Now it's approximate. You can check my mental calculation, and I don't think it's all that close, oh, hopefully within 1 or 2, um, but it's, it's not a totally accurate approximation. I don't want to take the time and to do all the calculations and maybe make a serious mistake. So to get the y-coordinate, we know the x-coordinate of the vertex is negative 15 fourths. We know the vertex is on the curve, so that if we plug negative 15 fourths into the function, it's going to give us the corresponding y-coordinate, which I say is approximately 8. So here's the calculation. Here's my approximate guess. Not more than a guess. Uh, so, there it is. Now, over here, I'm going to actually kind of label that. Okay, so now we've got negative 15 fourths 8, approximately. And we have the y-intercept, which is at 33. Well, if we draw, this isn't a real good parabola. If I draw a somewhat better parabola, Maybe it looks something like this, probably 
It's a little too straight there, but you get the idea. Okay, if this is 8, then 30, 33 is going to be about 1, 2, 3, 4 times that high. A little more than that, so that's going to be about here, so now I know where the y-axis should go. So there's kind of a picture of a labeled graph, and of course you have this over here, I don't want to go through my writing. Uh, so there's a lot you can tell about the graph of, of the function that you get if you went in the process of solving this equation. And that illustrates quite a bit of what you need to know about quadratic functions, especially the graphing aspect.